on a wet Saturday morning in Glasgow, nearly two dozen young people are singing and dancing in the freezing Scottish rain. For nearly 12 hours, they film a political music video campaigning for an independent Scotland. Half an hour down the road, both young and old alike man stalls campaigning for union, and for weeks on end, demonstrations are held throughout the country for a campaign that would shake up a nation. The independence referendum gave Scottish people an ownership in politics which they had not experienced for decades. Apathy pervaded our every movement, from choosing our futures to picking up our litter. And as a Scot and a Glaswegian, seeing 10,000 people marching through the streets of Glasgow city centre filled me with joy at our newfound political activism, as well as surprise at how much the political landscape in Scotland had changed since the referendum's story began. The referendum didn't simply wave such apathy away, but it did make us feel as though our voices mattered. And today, I will be talking about what inspired those two dozen young people to dance in the rain and what brought every single member of my society into the biggest political discussion of my lifetime. But first, let me backtrack to a little bit before that. My own childhood memories are of a very different Scotland. I remember being one of only a few of my peers who watched, um, who was shocked, enraged, and disappointed when, for the 2010 general election to select the next British Prime Minister, there was a less than 50% voting turnout in some areas of Glasgow. It felt as though no one could join the political conversation unless they were the cousin of the right person. In the words of my mother, there was a collective giving up. No one wanted to discuss politics because people felt so disenfranchised. I remember being one of only a few of my peers um, who was bundled up in the corner of the playground um, with a copy of The Economist in hand and a raging political curiosity. I remember being disappointed when I got to high school because people still weren't interested in the fact that America was about to elect its first mixed-race president. In fact, I was such an anomaly that my classmates dubbed me Obama girl without realizing that my personal political engagement went far beyond that strange land across the pond and was also deeply rooted in the issues within our own windy shores. I remember being one of only a few of my peers who was shocked, enraged, and disappointed when, for the 2010 general election to select the next British Prime Minister, there was a less than 50% voting turnout in some areas of Glasgow. I think people had little faith in a system which seemed to me to almost actively encourage such apathy, never mind trying to remove it. Combined with this, people felt as though their voices were lost in the clamour of British politics. When you have four countries to serve in just one parliament, issues affecting one small community can become lost. And so, when the referendum was announced in 2012, I think we were all a bit nonplussed. What need would we have for independence? Why challenge the status quo? But gradually, as the word got out, we were seduced and empowered, but for the sudden importance of our voices rather than for any particular side. Suddenly, I noticed I was having conversations about things that mattered to people, and I was overhearing them in a variety of places. From bus stops to supermarkets, the referendum was the word on everyone's lips. People were starting to talk about what kind of Scotland they wanted their children to be brought up in. But more importantly, they were talking about how they themselves could implement that future. 
Here was a campaign which everyone was a part of, regardless of which side you were on. And we capitalized on that. Bold campaigns that minted ownership to the people that they served. But I think this was especially true of Yes. Our slogan for Yes was Scotland's future in Scotland's hands. And this was an ideology which rang true throughout the movement. We didn't have a singular leader. We didn't have millions of pounds of donations. We didn't have multinational corporations supporting us, nor the mainstream media behind us. But we did have people. And that's why we as a movement were very special. I remember going canvassing on a Thursday night with my local campaign group and finding more volunteers than the organizers knew what to do with. My Facebook newsfeed was awash with articles being shared, pages that people had started up, but most importantly, conversations about what was going on. People had started to talk about their visions for Scotland, whether it was a country which should endorse nuclear weaponry or have stable job security, or a country which based its entire economy on oil. And they began trying to implement the future they had in their minds. But the referendum was special, because here we could implement that future by just marking a cross in a box. And that's why I'm more proud of the 83% turnout than I am of the huge gains Yes made, going from 17% Yes and a YouGov poll in January 2012 to 45% Yes in the final referendum. The Yes campaign was full of optimism, and the lack of hierarchy gave ordinary campaigners a sense of ownership and responsibility. Everyone did their bit. And the movement was accessible enough for everyone to feel a part of. Comedy nights or open mic nights were frequent throughout the city. A bar in the town centre started a monthly Glasgow session, which opened the referendum conversation on a monthly basis for anyone who wanted to join. And when we rallied, we really rallied. Glasgow's main square was temporarily dubbed Freedom Square, a name accredited to the thousands of campaigners that stood there in the days and weeks in the run-up to the referendum. Every Saturday, come rain or shine, stalls were erected up and down the country, handing out badges and stickers which could be seen on car bumpers and coat lapels throughout Scotland. And the campaign was accessible enough for everyone to feel a part of, including the man who decided to serenade over a hundred Labour MPs who came to Glasgow from London to campaign for a no vote with the Imperial March from Star Wars. connection and ownership of the movement, he felt empowered to do so. Similar to this were the young people I mentioned earlier. They were campaigning for the satirical character of Lady Alba, otherwise known as Zara Gladman, a Glaswegian academic with a creative and political mind who put her wits together to come up with video after video campaigning for independence. Another example of many were the activist group The Hills Have Eyes, Eyes, who would go around Scotland decorating famous public figures with Yes memorabilia. And this leads me on to one of the main criticisms of the Yes movement. My grandmother and others of her generation lived throughout the Second World War and inherited a deep fear of the kind of hedonistic nationalism that brought the Nazis to power. 
Blair Jenkins, the chief executive of the Yes Movement, said in 2014 that Yes was spiraling out of control and that they, as head office, could do little to stop its progress. Its intrinsic identity as a grassroots movement meant that many no voters felt a sense of aggression from Yes supporters. Yet the original Yes leadership had engineered this snowball effect as a way of trying to be as inclusive as possible without the explicit intention of alienating that particular sect of society. The fact was that the Yes movement was such a broad church that had we achieved independence, the movement would have inevitably fractured as we each fought for the independent country we had in our minds. We included people from every social, political, and economic background, yet the sense of ownership was equal for all involved. The advisory board, for example, was not made up of Scotland's elite. Instead, we included national leaders from the Scottish catering industry, from three of the major political parties, from national business leaders, to it, <laughs> from Scottish business people, to comedians. In 2013, the campaign elected me as part of their advisory board, which to me seemed representative of the kind of society which Yes campaigned for. Selecting a mixed-race 16-year-old with a 360 afro seemed representative of the campaign's ethos and mentality, and seemed metaphorical of the kind of society which Yes strived for, one of inclusion and collaboration. My friends were jealous of me, but not because I had achieved such a high-profile position. Rather, it was because my voice was suddenly being listened to. This is what the referendum created, a space for people to talk. And that's why, I think, and I think that's why, recently, there was the largest political rally in British history when Nicola Sturgeon, the current pro-independence first female first minister of Scotland, filled out the largest venue in the country, speaking to 12,000 people at the Scottish National Party's annual conference in Glasgow. And the Yes campaign, and the country that the Yes campaign lead, left behind, the country that the referendum left behind, well, I'm so proud of it. Three weeks after the referendum, three of the major political parties were led by women. And us campaigners were beaten down, but certainly not broken. I may never campaign beside the same people again, because we may not have another referendum for the next 25 years. But I can guarantee that those people who registered to vote for the first time in decades will not return to the same political apathy that pervaded Scotland before the referendum. The Scotland that the referendum left behind is totally different to the one I grew up in. I came to realize that I was never truly campaigning for independence as a concept. Instead, I was campaigning for a fairer and more equal society and a happier and healthier nation. I still stand by the idea that independence is the best way to achieve that society. But I now realize that the place that those teenagers dancing in the rain campaigned for is still possible from within union. And that is why the conversation that started with the referendum is still buzzing around Scotland and is growing by the day. Suddenly, campaigning for the Green Party or the SNP or the Labour Party on a Friday, on a Saturday morning is a good enough reason not to go out on a Friday night. Scotland has become instrumental in changing Britain from a historically two-party system that stultified British politics into a society striving for a multi-dimensional conversation. Our Scottish voices mattered once, and now, well, we just won't shut up. So thank you very much for listening.